Chapter forty three of Policy and Passion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Prade. Chapter forty three. The Knotting of the Threads. Events succeeded each other thickly after the death of the Premier. The public excitement and curiosity was intense and it was entirely owing to Dyson's exertions that only comparative publicity was given to the circumstances which attended Longleat's death, and that the true state of the case never came to Honoria's knowledge. The inquest was conducted as privately as possible, and a verdict was delivered to the effect that death had resulted from an overdose of a solution of prussic acid, administered medicinally to himself by the deceased, which had operated fatally upon an already diseased and excited condition of the arterial organs. It may be questioned how far the faculty and those more enlightened upon the subject coincided with the coroner's verdict, but, to the general public, it appeared satisfactory enough. The people mourned their leader as though he had been a hero. Letters were written in the newspapers advocating the erection of a monument at the public expense in commemoration of his patriotism and his virtues. His funeral cortege was followed by great and simple in the land. The public offices and shops were closed. The ships and steamers in the river wore their flags half-mast high. Obituary notices appeared in the journals of Leichardt's Land, edged with deep printer's black, and every sign of public mourning was rigorously observed. The excitement of Longleat's sudden death almost swept away that which had been produced by the extraordinary scene in the house on the evening preceding it. The debate was hushed up, and was never fully reported. Those who had believed in the Premier's guilt endeavoured for the sake of Dyson and Honoria to bury their convictions in their own breasts, while those whose faith in their chief had never wavered reverted triumphantly among themselves to his strenuous denial of Middleton's charge as conclusive evidence in his favour. Dyson Maddox had a long interview with the leader of the opposition, and succeeded in obtaining the papers relating to Prancard's trial, and a promise that the subject should be dropped without further inquiry. Later on, when the House met again, it was briefly alluded to and dismissed in a personal explanation by Mr. Middleton. But now the business of forming the new ministry occupied both sides to the exclusion of other considerations. The great loan bill was not passed that session. An amalgamation government was formed, upon which the views of both parties were modified in an extraordinary manner, and the railway question was waived till the following year. Dyson Maddox still retained his post, and Mr. Middleton accepted that of Attorney-General. Upon the night after her father's funeral, Honoria sat alone in the drawing-room at the Bunyas. Mrs. Ferris had been written to, and was expected to arrive from Kurulbin upon the morrow. It had been Honoria's wish that she had been sent for, and the old lady's feelings would have been deeply gratified could she have realized how ardently her advent was desired by her favorite charge. Honoria, broken down by the shock of her father's sudden death, by grief, remorse, and the more complex emotions of her own heart, was no longer the brilliant creature who had despised the old lady's babble and had gloried in her independence of the common solaces of vexed humanity. At present, she had an intense and womanly desire to sob out her late grief and agitation upon that sympathizing, if uncomprehending, bosom. Yet she was at this time calmer than she had been for months. The horror of sudden bereavement had counteracted the baleful effects of Barrington's influence, and the substitution of Dyson's soothing ministrations for the feverish and unhealthy fascination which the Englishman had exercised upon her, had restored her nervous system to a more equable balance. Dyson had been very near to her during the days which had followed her father's death. He had thought and acted for her, and had spared her from distressing contact with the outer world. So carefully did he guard her that not a breath of vulgar insinuation had as yet reached her ears. His tact and delicate consideration had saved her from much that would have been painful and annoying, and though he had never again spoken of his love, it seemed to encompass her like the air she breathed. She was thinking with some satisfaction that this was the last evening which she should spend by her solitary hearth, when suddenly a loud ring sounded at the entrance door, and a minute later, without warning or announcement, a gentleman was ushered into her presence. Honoria started to her feet and found herself confronted by Barrington. He was very pale and had the tall, gaunt look of a man who had just risen from a sickbed. He advanced slowly, 
with deep respect expressed in his gesture and bearing, while his hollow-set eyes mournfully sought her gaze. During her wakeful nights, Honoria had often of late trembled at the thought of this meeting. She had feared that, were she again to encounter Barrington's eyes, all power of self-control would desert her, and that she should once more become a prey to the nervous terror which in his presence had overpowered her. Yet, strange as it seemed to her then and later, after the momentary shock occasioned by his sudden appearance, she felt herself sustained by a moral and physical strength of which, in their former intercourse, she had been absolutely bereft. How and when she knew not, but it was certain that the enchantment had been broken. She stood up very tall and stately in her clinging black gown. A deep blush dyed her face and neck, but in a moment vanished and left an ashy paleness. "'I beg your pardon,' began Barrington. "'I am afraid that I have startled you. "'Forgive me. "'I would not let the servant announce me. "'I thought that if you heard my name "'you might perhaps refuse to see me. "'I have come to you as soon as it was possible. "'I am very weak. "'This is the first day that I have left my bed, "'but I could not rest longer without speaking to you. "'He spoke very quietly, "'and she, with the strange feeling of listening to her own voice "'as to the voice of another person,' replied in a low constrained manner you were right had i known that you were here i should have refused to see you it is an insult to me to force yourself upon me in this way you can have nothing to say to me now will you go at once if not i must leave the room honoria he exclaimed in a passionate tone as he approached and looked down upon her she shrank involuntarily he had placed himself so that she could not readily gain the door. A wave of scorn and indignation passed over her soul. She moved a step backwards, and then faced him without flinching. "'Let me pass,' she said. "'No. Will you not wait one moment and hear what I have to say? Are you afraid of me? Are you angry with me? What have I done that you should treat me so disdainfully? Is all my love to go for nothing because of a fancy?' a misconception? I swear that you were sacred to me. Could you have thought that I would insult you who had consented to bear my name? I have come to-night to ask you again to be my wife. I love you as I can love no other woman. What I offer you is not unworthy of your acceptance. I can place you in the station to which you are suited, amid the refined surroundings for which your nature has craved. I come to you in the deepest humility. I confess that I was greatly to blame for placing you in a position which might compromise you. I have endured agonies since that night. My madness, my passion for you led me beyond the bounds of prudence. I wish to atone. How can I prove my loyalty more effectually than by offering to make you my wife? You offer to make me your wife, she said in low, distinct tones. You are very loyal. Honoria, you will misunderstand me. I am ready now to sacrifice my prospects, to disregard my mother's prayers, if it is your desire that I should remain longer in Australia. Only tell me your wishes, and I will obey them at any cost. Darling, you were not so hard to move a little while ago. You know that your heart is all mine. It is I who have taught you to love. Oh, Honoria, come to me. Let me pass she said again with an imperious gesture. He fell back a few paces and she went on, speaking with withering scorn. Every word that you utter is an insult. Your love is an insult. I thought a little while ago that the shame of looking in your face would be too intolerable. I am glad that I have been able to bear it, that I might tell you with my own lips that the spell you cast over me is broken. I can have no feeling for you but pity. I wish never to hear your voice again. Good-bye. She walked steadily past him and left the room without bestowing upon him another word or a glance. When she had reached her own chamber, she bolted the door and threw herself, all quivering and unnerved, upon the bed. Barrington, left alone in the drawing-room, lingered for a little while in the hope that Honoria might return. He put forth all the strength of his will to recall her, but it was in vain. As she herself had said, the spell was broken. He stood looking round the room and noting all those little traces of the being beloved which are so patent to the eye of a lover, 
her work, her books, the flowers she had touched, the mirror which had reflected her beauty. And there was a maddening pain in the conviction which was borne in upon his heart that Honoria had passed out of his life for ever, and that he must fill up the blank as best he could. There was a photograph of her standing in a little velvet frame upon the mantel shelf. He took it up and carried it away with him. Upon the following day, Mrs. Ferris arrived from Kuralbin. The old lady kissed Honoria and blessed her and wept over her, at one moment bemoaning the rupture of her engagement with Barrington, who still retained a tender place in Aunt Penn's regard, at another congratulating her upon her impending marriage with Dyson. Mrs. Ferris shed many tears over the Premier's fate, and could find no terms of reprobation sufficiently strong to stigmatize the conduct of Mrs. Valency, who, she was convinced, had been at the bottom of all the mischief. "'Aunt Penelope,' said Honoria, when they had been talking for a little while together, "'I am thinking of going away for a time, and of taking Janie with me. I want a change of scene. Will you come with us to Tasmania? We shall spend the summer there, perhaps take a trip to New Zealand, and then winter in Sydney or Melbourne.' "'But what is to become of my old man?' cried Mrs. Ferris, with the tears streaming down her cheeks. "'My love, it went to my heart to leave him yesterday. I couldn't have done it if I hadn't felt it my duty to come to you. Anthony was always a little crazy, but since Angela died there isn't a grain of sense left in him. And he is such a poor weak creature, and has so fallen to nothing that a rough wind might easily blow him away. Now is my turn, my love.' There's always work in the world for geniuses. It's we dull women who must be the soothers and sympathizers. But do what I will, I can't interest Anthony. If he would only look at his pictures or take down his Shakespeare, I should feel happier. But there he sits all day long, with his hands folded before him, and his eyes fixed in a vacant stare upon the mountains or the sky, till a poor body's heart aches with the longing to comfort him. He takes no heed of anything. Even when I told him of your father's death, he just looked up and nodded his head, and it's my belief that when night came he had forgotten what I said to him. Honoria finally decided, and to her credit be it recorded, to invite the old man to bear them company in their travels. But this he curtly refused to do. He would not leave Coralbin, nor ever afterwards could he be persuaded to quit the vicinity of his daughter's grave. It was his harmless fancy that the spirit of Angela still hovered round her old haunts, and that in the dim twilight of a summer's evening he might again behold, in some secluded nook by the river, the shadowy, white-robed form of his lost darling. He lived on at Kuralbin, a decrepit old man of disconnected speech and wandering steps, whose closest earthly interest seemed centred upon the quiet spot beneath the cedar trees where Angela lay buried. Soon after the death of the Premier, Honoria, accompanied by Mrs. Ferris and Janie, set off on a visit to Tasmania. Dyson Maddox made all the necessary arrangements for their departure and absence from Leckhart's land, taking upon himself the burden of providing for the management of the various stations, and of all business transactions from which it was possible that Honoria could be relieved. With great tact and delicacy, he warded from her all distasteful companionship or malevolent gossip and guarded against any jarring of her sensibilities by a careful avoidance of allusion to their mutual relations. It was only by the strongest effort of self-control that he maintained the fraternal demeanour that characterised his intercourse with her, while she, in her turn, was nervously fearful lest he should suspect her of in any way misconstruing his motives. Though neither dared approach the subject, it had at first been tacitly understood between them that during Honoria's lengthy absence the rupture of the false engagement should be announced. But of late, as day by day her dependence upon him became greater, and her insight into his character deeper, frank understanding between them seemed to grow more and more impossible. A great sadness had settled upon Honoria. She was often silent, and indulged in fits of melancholy retrospection, brooding over the estrangement which had divided her from her father, upon their last mournful interview, and upon his wish, so forcibly expressed then, that she should become Dyson's wife. During the time that she remained at the Bunyas after the Premier's death, she shunned society, refused all sympathy and condolence, and, with a mingling of dread and impatience, waited for the moment of her departure and of her farewell to Dyson, when she fancied that the barrier of reserve between them might at last be broken down. 
he accompanied them as far as the bay whence he had arranged to return to leichardt's town in the government steam tug he too looked worn and harassed his eyes rested frequently upon honoria and he busied himself in preparations for her comfort but he held aloof from her side and seemed anxious to avoid taking advantage of any opportunity that occurred for private conversation between them honoria sat still upon the deck her eyes humid with unshed tears fixed vacantly upon the opposite shores a pain which she had never known before gnawing at her heart as she realized that each landmark past represented so many moments the less to be spent with dyson at last the freshening breeze laden with salt whiffs from the ocean the widening river the line of beacons which marked the bar the slackening of the steamer's speed told her that the time had come in a choked voice she called him to her he was at her side in a moment she rose from her seat and they moved apart and stood against the bulwarks together honoria raised her veil and he saw how pale she was and how her lips trembled and her eyes were dim with tears honoria he said only but there was deep meaning in his tone i am sorry she faltered sorry to say good-bye and i wish to thank you to tell you i cannot bear that we should part without a word you think that i have been blind to your goodness i have not indeed indeed i understand he said very low bending over her and tightly clasping her hand i did not mean to speak now i wished that you should go away that you should be untrammelled by any thought that i had the remotest claim upon your life all my desire has been to trample down my own feelings if it were best for you that i should be a cipher you know what has been in my heart and i have tried to root it out but it was of no use i thought that when you had gone away it would be less difficult perhaps to give you up if you cannot love me honoria as you have never yet loved it will be happiest for us both that we should never meet again and so it should be i would leave leichardt's land if otherwise then you have but to write me one word and i will come to you god keep you good-bye with one last pressure of her hand he left her side ere she could utter a word in reply presently he went on board the steam launch which turned her prow towards leichardt's town while honoria was borne across the bar oceanwards honoria took a cottage in hobart town where by the banks of the derwent she and janey passed several quiet months mrs ferris having installed her young charges in the care of an unobtrusive elderly friend returned to her husband at Curlbin. later on dyson maddox found his way to tasmania and he and honoria were married dyson is now premier of leichardt's land to him has been entrusted the floating of the loan and the carrying out of longleat's railway a little while ago he and his wife made the grand tour by way of america and spent a season in london where honoria had ample opportunities for studying english life mrs maddox was presented at court she was fortunate in having good introductions and her beauty and fascinating manners were the theme of comment in general and even fashionable society her reputation for enormous wealth added largely to her popularity and there was some talk of the formation of a company for the more effectual working of the tarangella tin mine at a dinner party in the house of a great london lady honoria met barrington he was with his wife the daughter of a peer a lady of statuesque appearance and cold manners who in a moment identified the australian beauty as the original of a certain photograph in a velvet-coloured frame which reposed in a secret drawer of her husband's dispatch-box and was connected with that brief sojourn in the antipodes of which she could never persuade him to speak frankly barrington and honoria bowed stiffly at first but afterwards lord and lady dolph bassett furnished a text for conversation lord dolph was still living at dyraaba neither less enthusiastic nor more practical than heretofore and maggie still rode buck jumpers and helped to brand the calves there was no talk of their coming to england nor did lord headington show any particular anxiety to greet his australian sister-in-law it would have been contrary to human nature had barrington abstained from satisfying himself as to whether honoria had found the true road to happiness probably he put a leading question for dyson hovering about his wife caught the words delivered with a stronger emphasis than the languid interest of an after-dinner conversation appeared to warrant 
i have never regretted having married an australian and i wish for no better fate than to cast in my lot with that of leichardt's land lady edith barrington joined with her husband in a courteous invitation to the maddoxes to visit castle barrington but it was declined and honoria never saw the home which might have been her own sammy deans is still accused of branding his neighbour's cattle and tom dungy has given up running the mail and has installed miss mccutchen as the mistress of the selection and of the little piebald corny cathcart has never been to barramunda since honoria went there shortly after her marriage he is managing the station up north which in the premier's will was left to little janey brian fielding is married and those interested in constant valancy's fate may witness her nightly performances as an actress at the regalia theatre honoria's boys are stalwart young australians who have already announced their intention of distinguishing themselves upon the boards of the house and who promise fair fulfilment of their grandfather's ambition End of chapter 43 End of Policy and Passion by Rosa Campbell Prade Recorded by Celine Major.